vision studies. The other advantage of going into the eye is it's very localized, so you can put the cells into a little bled right where you'd like them. And, and when we do these clinical trials, we're going to have real-time data. So unlike other clinical trials, we may have to wait till the patient passes away or you can get some histology. We can look right into the eye and we can actually see an individual retinal cell. So we can actually know in real time what's going on with these clinical trials. So we hope to uh, begin these uh, clinical trials in the coming weeks, uh, sometime uh, this summer. The uh, first uh, trial, and again, as I mentioned, involves Skagot's uh, macular dystrophy. Uh, again, the leading cause of, of juvenile macular blindness. It's not some children as young as age 6 to 10, and currently uh, it's untreatable. We also have FDA approval uh, to do the dry AMD. Uh, again, leading cause of uh, blindness in adults, and also currently untreatable. So the, each of these trials will start with 12 patients. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll start with just three of the patients with a small number of cells, 50,000 cells, which will, if there's no um, adverse effects, will increase to 100,000 with three patients, and then again to 150, and then finally 200,000. Now, this is uh, an immune privilege site, uh, and so we're not sure if we're going to encounter any sort of uh, problems with immune rejection. The data would suggest that within the, uh, with the uh, at least with the dry AMD, that, that may not be a problem. But just to be safe, uh, we are going to give transient low immuno, uh, dose immunosuppression perioperatively for a few weeks uh, until the cells uh, acclimate and then uh, withdraw that. And uh, this procedure can be either done under weight and sedation as an outpatient or under general anesthesia. And then, of course, uh, we're going to follow these patients very carefully. So uh, we're also pursuing uh, some, several other uh, uh, potential clinical applications that could get into the clinic uh, on the early side. So another uh, application is corneal repair. And over 10 million people have corneal blindness. Uh, it's actually the most transplanted organ. And about a third of all those transplants are performed due to an endothelial failure. And the current solutions uh, entail either the transplantation of the whole cornea, which is here at full thickness, and that's known as penetrating karyoplasty, or, or, K, uh, or PKP, or more popular and more recently, now uh, that we're starting to just transplant just the endothelial cells on Desmase membrane. So you're just actually putting in those uh, the, uh, uh, injured uh, endothelial cells. So we've uh, undertaken a project to actually create these corneal uh, endothelial cells. So this is showing you the, the ZO1 type junctions here of normal corneal endothelium. And these are the cells that were generated from embryonic stem cells. And likewise, the uh, sodium potassium ATP pump. Uh, you can see the staining here for the normal corneal uh, uh, endothelium. And these are the uh, uh, human embryonic stem cells. So there are a number of projects like that uh, that are also uh, ongoing. And I'd like to just briefly also touch on some projects that we are uh, carrying out uh, at Stem Cell uh, International uh, with, with our biotechnology that focus on the hemangioblasts. And the hemangioblasts are bipotential cells that can become not only the endothelium, and actually it turns out, I'll show you some data, where they can also make larger vessels with the smooth muscle, but also all the various myeloid and lymphoid uh, lineages. So uh, we published a paper in Nature Methods uh, a time ago where we actually showed the first time we could create these in large numbers from human embryonic stem cells. And they're basically clusters, grape-like clusters, pretty unremarkable. You wouldn't think very much of them, but they are quite impressive when you uh, try to, to use those in animals for therapy, which I'll, I'll touch quickly on. So as I mentioned, these are bipotential cells. So in the right culture conditions that foster endothelial differentiation, we can actually get these to form multi-layered vessels, again, not only with endothelium, but also they form smooth muscle. This is very important because you don't want to just create uh, you know, 
uh, capillary vasculature, you want to be able to create larger sized vessels, and indeed, uh, they contract when they are uh, exposed to carbocol. And so we wanted to see what these cells could do in vivo. So uh, some of the first studies were carried out with Maria Grant at the University of Florida. And she has an ischemia reperfusion injury to the eye, a model. And we were pretty surprised that we actually could label these cells, these uh, mangioblasts with a, a GFP dye. And when they were injected into the vasculature, within 24 to 48 hours, you can see here in green, they started incorporating into the damaged vasculature. The contralateral eye that was normal over here there was no incorporation. So these cells were really smart and they homed directly to the site of injury very quickly. In fact, if you put in large numbers of these cells individually into the eye, they'll just sit there as a sheet. So again, we can take advantage of, of these uh, cells' natural ability to, to home to the site of injury. And so this was another uh, model. This is actually uh, a type 2 diabetic rat, a spontaneously diabetic animal. And again, similar studies where we can inject these either intravitrally or systemically. And here you can see within a couple days, here the green are the hemangioblasts uh, repairing the damaged vasculature. But you can easily imagine, this is what we can just see in the eye. In type, in, in diabetes in general, all the horrible secondary compli com complications are microvascular in nature. So whether it's, it's, it's you know, uh, heart disease or kidney failure or limb amputations, you can imagine these cells aren't probably just repairing the corneal, the, the uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy, but they're probably going in and trying to repair uh, other areas of the body that have been damaged by the disease. So you can imagine the enormous potential these cells could have clinically. This is another study uh, using the hemangioblasts. This was work done with Malcolm Moore's group at the Sloan Kettering Institute. And this, these are uh, uh, animals that have had a ligation of, of the uh, artery to one of the limbs. And so you can see uh, this on a Doppler, very little blood flow on the, 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 the left side. And here you can see the normal blood flow. And after injection, a single injection of these hemangioblasts, 30 days, we had almost complete restoration of the blood flow. And um, with, with Malcolm's group, we also studied a, a, a model of severe myocardial infarct in the mouse. And again, with the injection of the blast colonies, the, the mangioblast, we actually saw uh, a reduction in the, the mortality rate by 50%. So again, you can imagine all kinds of uh, ischemia, ischemia, be it coronary artery disease or whatever, where these cells uh, could have uh, uh, great uh, clinical potential. But as we're talking about early clinical translation, those issues are going to, uh, if you're dealing with uh, the peripheral immune system, we still need to confront the problem of immune rejection. However, as I mentioned to you, that mangioblast is by, by potential, and you know, we've characterized it in its TIPO and EPO uh, positive. But in addition to turning into the uh, endothelial cells and, and uptake of LDL, for instance, we can also encourage these to go into the metabolic lineage so that they actually can form erythroid cells, myeloid cells, and multi-potential colonies. So that we published a paper in blood where we showed by uh, the direct, by influencing how these cells are exposed in the petri dish, we could create entire tubes of red blood cells. Uh, and they actually, it turned out, had oxygen transport properties identical to normal transfusable blood. And uh, however, the hemoglobin, it was mainly the uh, fetal and, uh, uh, and embryonic forms. So uh, we looked at uh, various embryonic stem cell lines, and we looked at the, uh, the, the uh, RH, uh, D, and we actually found that uh, we could create cells. Uh, it turned out all of the Y cells were, were RHD positive. We had a few that were negative. We were also able to show that we could create type A blood, type B blood, and type O blood. And the goal here, of course, is, is to make universal blood. So if you can make O negative blood starting uh, with, with the right uh, either ES cells or IPS cells, you could make blood that would match everyone in the room. And, and that's ideal, particularly for the military. For instance, if someone 
is injured on the battlefield, and there's a serious shortage of type O blood, especially in, in, in the Asian countries, which is far less even than uh, in the U.S. So we would be able to make unlimited supplies of these cells that at the present uh, were often very serious shortages. The other uh, property of red blood cells, of course, is, is that they are enucleated. They have no nucleus. So these uh, primitive erythroid cells that we initially generate uh, are nucleated, but with time, we were able to get them, the cells would gradually, the, the chromatin would condense smaller and smaller, the cells would get smaller, and eventually uh, the uh, nuclei would be uh, ejected and you would end up with the nucleated cells. And so uh, we found for the first time that we could actually get these cells to a nuclear. Now, for clinical application, this is profoundly important. We don't have to worry about tumors or, or, or teratomas. There's, there's no nuclei. So, so that's why these would be ideal. Of course, red blood cells uh, only live uh, 120 or so days. So again, the uh, preclinical data that would be necessary, you know, that would be truncated quite considerably versus normal nucleated cells, which you have to follow uh, for any regulatory agency for the full lifetime of the animals. And we've also uh, recently shown, too, that we can actually mature these cells further so that they start to also express uh, the beta globin, uh, hemoglobin, so that uh, by day, uh, day 28, we actually are, are having uh, beta globin profiles similar to in bone marrow. And also, again, as I mentioned, these uh, mandioblasts can be turned into all sorts of different cells, uh, and dendritic cells, etc. Uh, but again, the other cell type of interest to us is the megakaryocyte, which of course gives rise to the platelets. And so we have now, we published a paper recently where we showed for the first time that we can get very large amounts of these megakaryocytes using these hemangioblast intermediates. And it turns out actually that they have the ability to, to form clots, uh, the platelets, and, and undergo retraction. And they also incorporate into the, uh, the mouse from the site at this, the site of laser-induced arterial uh, injury. So you can see here uh, both from normal red blood, uh, platelets and normal, uh, and these uh, from the embryonic stem cells uh, that they incorporated very nicely in, 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 a, in a specific uh, platelet fashion. And then just very quickly, I just want to mention that we're also trying to address the two other major concerns. The one is the ethical concern, and the other one, of course, is the problem of immune rejection. So we published a paper in Nature a while back where we showed for the first time we could just pluck out using a biopsy procedure that's routinely used in IVF clinics to just take one cell from an eight-cell stage embryo and create embryonic stem cell lines. We subsequently published a paper where we actually created five fully characterized uh, embryonic stem cell lines where the remaining biopsy embryo developed to uh, a blastocyst and they were frozen down. So we have these lines where no embryos were destroyed. And then you've also heard earlier from uh, uh, Kwang, Kwang Soo Kim's uh, work uh, on cellular reprogramming. So we've been working on, on this as well for uh, almost a decade at this point. But the goal, of course, is to be able to create patient-specific cells for clinical translation. And again, uh, the, uh, the method uh, that Dr. Kim is using is, is the cell-penetrating peptides. So the hope is, is that we would be able to then uh, move into some of the uh, applications that are going to require us to overcome the problem of rejection. And then finally, and very importantly, I'd like to thank the people who actually did the work, and, and that includes uh, 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 Dr. Liu and, and Dr. Chung at uh, uh, STEM International, Irina Klemenskaya at ACT, and, and again, uh, Kwang Soo Kim uh, at Harvard and Blaine, and obviously many other people who were involved in this work. Thank you. Biological Research Information Center, BRIC.